Hello and welcome to the Lansdowne Bible Study for the 1st of June 2021. This is our final study in the book of 2 Peter, of 2 Peter. Let's pray and then let me read the closing passage to you. Let's bow our hearts before God. Our Father, we confess our dependence upon you to understand and apply your word. Father, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures that you have breathed out and caused to be written for us. We thank you that these are your very words. And we pray that today, as we hear this message, that we would truly hear your voice. Give us that understanding, Lord. Give us, we pray, a desire to respond in obedience. Give us that strength to persevere. Encourage and challenge us today, we pray. And Lord God, to you be the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our passage, as we conclude our studies in 2 Peter, starts at chapter 3 and verse 14. So 2 Peter, chapter 3 and verse 14, down to the end of the book. 2 Peter 3, verse 14. Let's hear God's word. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks of, the, of them, sorry, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your stability but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Praise God for his word. Now, Peter wrote, as I'm sure you'll remember if you've been following these studies in 2 Peter, Peter wrote this book to protect the churches from being led astray by false teaching. As we know from the title of the book, 2 Peter, there is also a 1 Peter, 1 Peter. And that book was written to ground God's people in their faith, uh, to encourage them in godly living, and to prepare them for the attack of persecution. And then when you come to 2 Peter, Peter is preparing these people for a different form of attack. And that attack comes through false teaching. Now, it's a huge challenge to face persecution. But it is a different but nonetheless very real challenge to face false teaching. Because if we take false teaching on board, we lose sight of who God is, we lose sight of the gospel, and we become weak and ineffective believers. And if we're uh, attending a church or even listening on, online and we're not believers, we can become uh, further away from the Lord because we start believing a false gospel. And so our condition is very, very serious because we might think we're saved, but actually we've embraced a false gospel. And so true teaching is absolutely essential. Without that true teaching, we cannot know the Lord. And we certainly cannot be built up in the Lord and grow 
in the Christian faith. And so, if you've been following us, you will have noticed this, I'm sure. Chapter 1 of 2 Peter covers the wonder of the gospel, what God has done and how we need to grow in the gospel and our response to the gospel and why we can rely on the gospel because the gospel is revealed to us by God's word, the scriptures that have been given to us as people uh, wrote them, carried along by the Holy Spirit. So they wrote God's true words. And then in chapter two, we are warned about false teachers and the danger of them and what, how they live so that we can spot them. Uh, but also the encouragement of uh, two, chapter 2, verse 9, that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial. So it's an encouragement to his readers and to us that even when we're bombarded by false teaching and indeed persecution, as in 1 Peter, we are preserved and kept by the Lord. And then in chapter three, which we've been on for the last few sessions, this has been about the future hope as we wait, uh, verse 13, for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. But we don't wait passively. And the conclusion of 2 Peter encourages us and challenges us and warns us so that we might live our days out before Christ's coming or before we leave this earth if we die before Christ comes. We might live as those who are grounded in his truth and not led astray. So what does Peter have to tell us in these concluding words? All these points begin with the word be, as in be, not the bees that buzz, but be as in being or something that we need to, a way we need to exist and live. And the first is be diligent, which we find in verse 14. It says, therefore, beloved, and we've seen that word before, uh, he brings that out in chapter 3 and verse 1. This is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. The church is precious. A true Christian leader loves the people of God, serves the people of God, and does not see the people of God as those that they can gain from. In fact, seeking to gain from other believers, uh, certainly financially or in terms of prestige, then that is a, a, a sign of someone who is probably a false teacher because their heart is not right. But Peter's attitude, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, what are these? It's a fulfillment of the promise of a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's a fulfillment of the promise of his coming, as is referred to in chapter 3 and verse 4. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? Well, we've seen that the reasons that the Lord has delayed in our previous studies, and you can look them up by going back a bit further in YouTube. And so in the light of the fact we're waiting, we're eagerly longing for Christ's return, or should be, looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth, there is a response, and it's be diligent. Diligence is the opposite of passivity. It means to be careful, to make every effort, to focus rather than drift. The reason for this effort is spelled out, what we're to be diligent for or to do. We're to be diligent firstly to be found by him. To be found by him. That shows that actually God knows us through and through, that when Christ returns, we will stand before his throne. This thought is picked up in an old hymn and that's also been uh, made into a modern version. And the last verse of this hymn says, when Christ shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. That comes from this verse, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand 
before his throne. Christ is the solid rock on which we stand, says the old version or the new version, Christ alone, cornerstone. He's the foundation of everything in our lives. But when we, but our heart's desire is when he comes, we will be found in him, found by him, living in a way which is honouring and glorifying to him. Be found by him without spot or blemish. Now, this is very important because we can fool one another. We can even fool ourselves by being um, doing right on the surface of our lives, looking the part on a Sunday or on a Zoom meeting. But when Christ comes, we're found by him who sees all things. And he was a call to be without spot or blemish. This is the opposite of the way in which the false teachers are described in chapter 2 and verse 13, where it says that they are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. So we're to be the opposite of that. We're to take sin seriously and fight against it. Now, this is not perfection, but direction of life uh, that reaches its fulfilment when we stand before his throne, clothed in righteousness alone. On that day, according to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That is his, his purpose in saving us. But because that's our destiny and because the new heavens and the new earth are the place where righteousness dwells, we anticipate we anticipate, we live for that now by seeking to put sin to death. And when we do sin, we come to him for cleansing. Verse 14 also says at the end, and at peace. So be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Now we know from Romans 5 verse 1 that peace is our condition before him if we are saved since you have been justified by faith you have peace with God so we could be understand this verse as saying to the congregations that Peter is writing to which will have people attending the church meetings who are not yet believers he may he could be saying this make sure that you have trusted Christ and that you have peace with God, and that you stand before him on that day. But peace is also part of our experience in our relationship with God. And also, if we're in right relationship with God, we should be in right relationship with one another. So we need to guard that peace, that enjoyment of peace with God, which often we lose through false teaching. We don't see the Lord as he really is and the gospel as wonderful as it really is. And false teaching also divides believers. So we end up losing peace with one another. And so we need to be diligent. And if we start going astray, then those others in the fellowship who are not yet saved will also be led astray by the false teaching and they will be lost because they're not believing the true gospel. So we need to be diligent on our guard to live godly and to walk in God's ways at peace with him as we look forward to standing before his throne clothed in righteousness alone. So be diligent. Secondly, be active. Verse 15, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Now this points us back to what Peter said a little bit earlier in verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfil his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, 
but that all should reach repentance. For those of us who believe God's patience meant salvation, we should be amazed and thankful for his patience in waiting to save us before Christ's return. He could have come sooner, but he didn't. Praise the Lord. And for those who are in the church who are not yet saved, this patience is time for you to repent and believe and be saved. And also for all Christians, this time presents the opportunity for salvation for those around us. So we need to be active in sharing the good news of salvation. So be diligent, be active, and then thirdly, be biblical. Be biblical. Peter says this, he says, just as, he's halfway through verse 15, our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. And then he goes on, as he does, verse 16, in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. Now, obviously, we're not sure precisely of which letter or letters the Apostle Peter was referring to. One example of talking about the coming of Christ and living lives of holiness is found in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And certainly 1 Thessalonians was one of, the, one of the earliest letters that Paul wrote. So it's very likely that Peter's readers would also be aware of this letter as well as other letters to the Ephesians and Colossians and so on. So he they'd be aware of what Paul spoke about. And Paul's letters, it seems from the phrase, all his letters in verse 16, that would be all that Peter knew about, that a good number of Paul's letters were circulating among the churches. Why? Well, because of how Peter describes them in these verses. In verse 15, Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. He was writing with divine wisdom. And then alongside Peter's warning, which we'll come on to in verse 16 about not twisting Paul's letters. Peter says, as they do the other scriptures. So Peter places Paul's letters on the same level as scripture because they are scripture. They are God's word written by him through Paul, so they are inspired, inerrant and infallible. Now, the negative point that Peter's making here, which we'll come to in a moment, is, is false teachers twist scripture. But the positive point that we're waiting, that, that while we're waiting for Christ's coming, we need to be Bible people. We need to immerse ourselves in the whole of God's word, the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures, so that we're able to do what he says next, and that is to be discerning. So be diligent, be active, be biblical people. All of these are while we are waiting, since you are waiting for these, the new heaven and the new earth, verses 13 and 14. So be discerning. Now, I do find uh, verse 16 quite encouraging when it says there are some things in them, that is Paul's letters, that are hard to understand. Now, notice it says hard. It doesn't say impossible. To understand parts of Paul's letters, some are plain and obvious on first reading. But even then we go deeper and deeper as we meditate upon them and see the, the glories of what which Paul is writing about, what God is saying to us through his word. But there are some harder passages 
and they require that we immerse ourselves in God's word and we interpret we interpret scripture by scripture so that we come to a right understanding and as it says in verse 18 grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Verse 17 gives us a strong warning it says you therefore beloved knowing this beforehand take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Now this take care is because of what he says in verse 16 that there are ignorant and unstable people who twist the scriptures to their own their own destruction. So there's two descriptions of these people. They are firstly ignorant. That's a huge challenge. They are basically untaught. Now we live in an, an age where many people want in the church want to be leaders they want to be pastors or elders they want to preach so that they are known and respected it's part of our society that, that actually we become the center of the universe and not god and there's a huge danger in this if such people are basically ignorant or untaught because then they are much more likely to misinterpret the scriptures and lead God's people and lead those visiting the church who are seeking, lead them into error. Now, while it's not essential, it is very, very helpful that a pastor has Bible training at Theological College or at very least by correspondence course. And I say it's not essential, it's not something I have myself, but it's certainly something I would strongly recommend. We don't seem to just promote people who may be gifted or may look the part. When we get on to, sun, to, to next Sunday, we're going to see how Saul of Tarsus looked the part. But then as 1 Samuel goes on, he certainly isn't God's man. And so we must appoint people to preach who are well taught and who are not ignorant and that's the job of the elders if someone's going to regularly preach in a local church be they the pastor or a teaching elder or a, a, a regular visiting speaker we need to be sure that they are well taught so that god's people are protected it also speaks of them being unstable that word is found in verse 14 where sorry chapter 2 verse 14 where it says about the false teachers they entice unsteady souls so there are people who are unsteady they're not grounded in the truth that's why i said earlier to be biblical we need to, to interpret scripture by scripture if we don't understand something we don't just pick something out of our head we search the scriptures and in our busy lives we haven't got time we lay that aside and then we go back to it at a later time and we don't speak about it and try and explain it without having come to an understanding and that's where elders and pastors are so important to teach us when we are unsteady in our understanding then notice too it says they twist the scriptures that word for twist has a, its origin in uh, the torture chamber, devices of torture, which twist people's bones and bodies and damage them. And that's what false teaching does. It twists, it distorts a scripture, it places a scripture as it were out of joint so that actually error comes. The truth is lost. The gospel is lost. And this is not talking simply about minor errors or disagreements, for example, over the mode of baptism or the way of Christ's second coming or gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is talking about gospel destroying errors. And we must therefore oppose any people 
who undermine the gospel, who undermine who God is in himself, in his eternal triune majesty, in Christ as God the Son, and his, his substitutionary atonement, his death upon the cross, in the place of sinners, his glorious bodily resurrection, his ascension, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the things we, we speak about in the creed, those fundamental foundational truths that, that salvation is by by grace alone through faith alone in christ alone to god alone be the glory that our authority is scripture alone these are the fundamental truths we must not move from and while i've spoken about leaders this also speaks to all of us because the command to take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people is written to all of us he says beloved knowing this beforehand we've got it for us into peter that's why it's been written so that we can be prepared and ready and we need to therefore be discerning and stand on the word of god not to be carried away not to be deceived the idea of error is wandering away from the truth not to lose our stability not to fall, be carried away. Now, a true believer cannot be carried away from the gospel. They cannot ultimately be lost. But we can become weak and ineffective and lose our peace and not preach the gospel rightly so we stumble other people. And although a Christian cannot lose salvation, God uses warnings of scripture to enable us to persevere. So we need to take this seriously. That, it, that, that actually, yes, you say, I know I'm born again. I put my trust in Jesus on this day and I love him. I love his word. That doesn't exempt us from the, the warning to stay standing firm on the word of God. We must do it for our own growth and peace and assurance but also for those others around who do not know the Lord and if they see us listening to false teaching then they will be captivated by it too and may not become to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved hence that the, 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 the delay that the Lord speaks of in verse 15 that patient of the Lord is salvation and actually we are failing in our obligation to be grounded in God's word, to be biblical and discerning and to witness and live according to the truth. And then other people stumble also. May God he protect us and keep us strong in him in these troubled days. So be diligent, be diligent, be active, be biblical, be discerning, and finally, be growing. Be growing. Verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. So Peter moves from the negative of be diligent, stand firm, guard yourself, be biblical, be discerning, to the positive. Now, through these same scriptures that you train yourself to be guarded against false teachers these same scriptures and the same holy spirit who wrote the scriptures and enables you to persevere will also enable you to grow in grace and knowledge grace grace is god's unmerited favor grace is also the ongoing supply of god's strength and provision and a passion for holiness and a love for his word that are imparted to us through his Holy Spirit. Growing in grace means growing in these things. It means growing in an appreciation of the gospel. It means growing in a realization of how much he's done for us. We sing, for example, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But in our heads, we can be thinking, well, I wasn't that bad. Wretch is a bit strong. I was kind of, I had a bit of a mess in my life. The Lord saved me from that, but I wasn't that bad. 
but growing in grace causes us to see how wonderful the grace of God is, how sinful we are, but yet how amazing it is that the Lord has stepped down to save us, to rescue us, to lift us up, to deliver us from our sins. Such amazing grace that he would save even me and you by his grace alone. And as we see this and become more amazed, then the, the kind of false glitter of error is seen for what it is. Things that take away from the wonder of who Jesus is and what he has done. I remember going to a, a school assembly and they, 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 they sang um, this the song, and there's a line that goes something like, I, though so unworthy, still am a child of his care. And then there was a meeting afterwards, a governor's meeting, and the governors were complaining that we should be making the children feel good about themselves rather than reminding them of their unworthiness before God. But if we talk about, and yes, we have a very precious identity in Christ, which shows that the great and precious worth the Lord has placed upon us. But in and of ourselves, we are unworthy sinners in need of grace. And where there's teaching that says, look in the mirror and tell you how good you are, how, how wonderful you are, how precious you are, and forget to remind us of amazing grace, then that is false teaching. Because while we are precious in his sight, while we are the object of his overwhelming affection and love that he loves us uh, despite our sins he he reaches out to us and rescues us in our sins he he loves us with an everlasting love all that is true it is grace and not worth in and of ourselves and growing in grace causes us to marvel at the glorious gospel but it also says doesn't it grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a knowledge both of learning and of experience. This is a knowledge that comes to us through the word of God. As we look at the word of God, as we meditate upon it, as we hear it preached to us, as God speaks to us from it in our daily readings and in our times all together as the family of God. We need to grow to know him and we grow to enjoy him through the work of the Holy Spirit, as that knowledge moves into experience of him. We grow to be conformed more and more to his likeness. As we touched on last Sunday, when the Israel was saying in 1 Samuel 8, we want to be like the nations. No, no, we want to be like Christ. And we come to be like Christ through growing to know him. And we come to marvel at him because notice it says our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, to him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. And saying to him be the glory is saying he's God. You know, God says, I do not give my glory to another. So Jesus is God. And through this diligence, through the activity of sharing our faith, through being biblical, through being discerning because we're biblical, through growing in grace and growing in the knowledge of the Lord, then we bring him glory. We bring him glory right now as we live out what he's taught us, as we, we seek to serve him and honour him because we've we've met him in the word of God. We're amazed that he would save us. We're amazed at God's sovereign plan. We're amazed that we've been adopted and forgiven and that we're treasured and we're loved. We're amazed that a wretch like me should be saved by such a holy and yet gracious God. And so we say, Lord, I want to give you glory. I want to know you more. I want to obey you more. I want to become more like Christ. And I want to give you glory. And I look forward to that time when I see your glory face to face. 
because the Lord is not slow when the full number of God's people are gathered in. Christ will return. If you're listening to this, are you among that number of those who are saved? Call, if you're not, call upon Jesus now. There's no other saviour. Tell him the sins you've committed. Ask him to forgive you and commit your life to him. Turn away from your sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. And Christians, be diligent, be active, be biblical, be discerning and be growing every day for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your wonderful word. Lord, as the words I've just said about us being diligent and active and biblical and discerning and growing. Lord, help us with these things. Work them into our hearts and minds. May we live them out and may we bring you great glory. May we bring you great glory as others see your patience as salvation and put their trust in Jesus Christ. And may you, we bring you glory by living holy, blameless, spotless lives at peace with you, looking for and hastening the coming of your great day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I have failed singularly since I said I would try and do something shorter on the weeks we were having our online prayer meeting. And I apologise for that, but the scriptures are so rich and there's so much more that we can grow in as we spend time in his word. So very quickly, just some points for prayer. Let's give thanks that we know him and pray that we know him better and we live lives worthy of him. Let's pray that we would count the Lord's patience as salvation and be active in sharing our faith. Pray for the teaching of God's word at Lansdowne and also your own church if you're not at Lansdowne. Pray too for protection from false teaching. Pray for those at Lansdowne and in your own church if you go elsewhere that will be grounded in scripture, not ignorant or unstable, not twisting the word of God. And pray about some of the challenges that are going on in our nation at the moment, not least COVID-19 and the spread of the Indian variant. But even more, important than, even more important than that, the way in which we are living as a nation. There are two new laws that are potentially cut, uh, going through Parliament. One is about assisted dying. Our lives are in God's hands, not in the lives of doctors. And secondly, there are proposals for a banning of conversion therapy, people seeking to change their sexuality. Now, there have been many, many abuses of this, and it's absolutely right that such abuses are stopped. But praying for people who want help in fighting temptation should not be stopped. And so we must ask God to protect the right for us to pray and bring godly counsel to people. And finally, please pray for those in Lansdowne or your own church who need the Lord's healing, comfort and provision. May God bless you in abundance and thank you once more for listening to this message.